Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing my conversations with Brother Jason Jack, and we're doing a series titled uh, 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. And out of 101 verses, today we're doing, starting with verse number 45 on the list. Uh, so we've already covered a lot of ground, and if you have not seen the previous videos, I hope you will go back and watch this whole series from the beginning. And that playlist is available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, so today we'll get started, and it's Ezekiel... Uh, uh, 3313. Uh, before we get started, uh, brother, do you want to say hi or any opening thoughts? Hey, everybody, just ready for another video. All right, very good then. Uh, since I'm a KJV firstist, I'll read it in the KJV. It's uh, when I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live. If he trusts to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Hmm. Well, okay, brother. Uh, the, the pressure's on you. You get to go first. Out of all the good works that you do, you're still a sinner. 
And if you offended one point, you're guilty of the entire law. Therefore, you need a savior. You need to rely on God and trust in him and his righteousness and his promises that you will receive the free gift of eternal life through faith in him and not rely or trust in yourself. So I think that's what the gist of this verse is talking about if we look at it from an eternal salvation standpoint. But this whole passage, I think, is really um, talking about the house of Israel and the people within it. Some are righteous, some are wicked, but overall, the cause of the iniquity of the house of Israel, that they were going to perish without, that if they didn't change their ways. And so that's what the Lord was telling Ezekiel to warn them about. Hmm. Yeah, well, I, uh, as I said in our last uh, video, um, there are some books in the Old Testament that I've really uh, delved into, and I can say that I, uh, with confidence, I really understand the book. Uh, but there's many other books that I haven't really done any verse by verse study on, even though I've read them. Uh, I, I really don't feel like I'm a, a, can speak with like an authority on it. Uh, so the the point that you made as far as the context, uh, I'm sure that's a valid point. But if we think of this verse uh, uh, in terms of uh, eternal salvation, rather than being saved from, let's say, some kind of calamity. See, a lot of times people see a word in the Bible uh, like um, saved uh, or fire. Uh, and, and they automatically think that saved means saved from uh, hell, from uh, judgment, rather than being saved from uh, an army that's going to come into the city, you know. Uh, or they see fire and they always think that, well, that's referring, referencing hell rather than uh, in some other type of a, you know, maybe a volcano going off or something. Um, so we we have to be careful not to always assume that uh, uh, the word doesn't mean the same thing every every time it appears in the Bible, saved or fire or other other verses like that. I mean, other words like that. So that's a that's a very valid point. But if we're uh, applying this verse towards uh, to soteriology, which is the study of salvation then you're exactly right that this goes along with the verse in James. There's another verse just like it in Galatians, I believe, that's basically saying that uh, if you uh, if you want to be judged by on your own merit, your ability to keep the laws and follow all the commandments, then, um, then the standard you have to uh, satisfy is perfect. Uh, you have to follow it perfectly with not even one mistake. Because uh, how many sins does it take to uh, before you call someone a sinner? Uh, one sin, uh, and they, they, they're a labeled sinner. And, and not only are they labeled a sinner, but uh, it's not even a question of degrees. You, you know, you're, um, um, man likes to um, think of himself and, and, and also compare uh, himself to others uh, in terms of relative goodness uh, but but God uh, doesn't uh, see it that way God sees it in um, the, the standard is not relative like you're pretty good compared to the other guy uh, no it, it, the standard is are you equal to Jesus <laughs> you know if you're not equal to Jesus then you're not good and uh, if you've sinned one time and I've sinned a million times, we are both, uh, it's fair to label us both as sinners. Um, so uh, that's the point I think uh, this verse is really making here. It says if, if you trust in his own righteousness, so the viewing audience, if you think that you, if you want to go to heaven and be judged based upon your own righteousness, and you want to uh, plead your case to God saying that you're good enough to get into heaven, look at my righteousness, God. Then this verse is saying that if you commit iniquity, which is uh, anything that's bad, 
if you commit iniquity, that means it doesn't mean it didn't say you commit iniquity every day of your life. Didn't say you commit iniquity more than the average person. Just says if you commit iniquity, if you've done it even one time, then all your righteousness shall not be remembered. So um, I used to uh, I, one of the original series I did on YouTube was uh, called uh, the title of the series is called Truth, and uh, one of the points I make in that series is that people think that. Um, they can be judged by God based upon, uh, let's say, well, uh, I need to get an A. And uh, to get an A, uh, it's 96%. So if you have, if you have a, an exam in school and there's 100 questions, you can miss four of them and 96 still is an A. And so they think that there's some kind of a scale like that that you're going to be judged. So, uh, uh, and but no, the, the standard is not... Uh, 95% uh, is not good enough. 99% uh, uh, isn't even good enough. It's 100% is what's required for your score. Uh, that means you've you've been perfect without fail. Uh, and so, and then other people they think that in terms of comparing themselves to others, they think, well, God will grade us on a curve, you know, and instead of a scale like 95 is an A and 80 is a C or no, they, they, they think that it's a curve. I just, as long as I'm better than the average person, I'll be okay. But God doesn't grade on a scale, and he doesn't grade on a curve. God grades pass-fail. And, and it's just, you're either, you're either perfect or you're lost. And so that's really what this, this verse here is making that point, that if you, if you want to be judged on your own righteousness, you cannot ever have committed any iniquity at all. Um, all right, any any response to that or anything else on this verse? No, I think that was excellent. All right, then. Well, let's go to the next verse. Uh, and that is John 14, 6. We'll see. Um, uh, either, there's probably about, you know, 10 or 20 or 30, you know, standard go-to verses that, uh, you know, that we uh, evangelists, uh, you know, use these verses primarily. Now, I know we, we're talking about 101 verses, but if we really wanted to do a thorough uh, list, really comprehensive, we would probably make a list of 200 or 300 or more verses to support this, this uh, doctrine that, Salvation is by faith alone. Uh, but this one here and a handful of others are really the standard go-to verses. John 14, 6, in the KJV, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All right, brother, that you get the thrill of uh Teaching this verse. Well, this is one of my favorite verses. I'm sure as yours too. Uh, in the Bible, on my YouTube channel, at the top of the, my banner basically has the way, the truth, and the life as the banner in John 14, 6. So, um, you know, this speaks of who Jesus is, that he is God, that Son of God, that He is truth. He's the only way. There's no other way uh, to eternal life. He is eternal life, as it says in First John five twenty. And all these go hand in hand. These are. This is one of many verses that points to Jesus Christ as the only way to eternal life. And there's no salvation outside of Him. Um, you know, we I think have covered at four twelve and. Um, where it says there's no other name under heaven given on him whereby we must be saved. I think we covered John 8.24 where Jesus says, I said therefore to you that you shall die in your sins, for you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And, you know, many, many more verses. Um, and these are coming out of the mouth of Jesus. And so, you know, we believe Jesus as Christian, 
that we believe he is true and he is the way and he's alive, then we should be telling others that. And we shouldn't be compromising that. You know, this is that this truth is not a message of condemnation to other faiths, uh, our beliefs, or other people. This is a message of absolute truth. And we can trust that it's true because every word in the Bible is pure and true and eternal. Just as Jesus is eternal. And so when we point to these type of verses to others, we should, again, show these verses out of love and gentleness and kindness to tell them the true gospel. But at the same time, we should stand firm in our faith and be grounded and settled and understand that these are absolute truths which we speak from the Word of God and that they cannot be compromised at all. And but yet we see pastors all the time in the in the Christian uh, ministries that will be part of ecumenical movements and join hand in hand with rabbis and imams and Buddhist temple leaders and Hindu leaders in the name of unity and coexistence and this interfaith dialogue which um, has gotten worse and worse over the last 30 years and you know where it's coming into a lot of churches and Christians who are reading their Bible they don't even know these verses or they don't understand them and they're their meaning, even though it's so obvious. And so I think this verse not only shows that Jesus is the only way to eternal life, that he's the truth, he is the only way, but it also is a reminder for all Christians who are out in the world, you know, whether it's at the workplace or at the ball fields or wherever else. At the amusement park, uh, you know, and, and we live in a secular world um, with a lot of different faiths and beliefs. We need to stand firm on these truths and the gospel, and that Jesus Christ is the only way, uh, and never compromise it. I've uh, um, I've watched this. Uh, I guess I could call him a celebrity uh, on TV for, for many years, uh, Larry King. He's uh, supposed to be, I guess he has a news, uh, he had a news show for the longest time. Uh, and every time Larry King would uh, have a theologian uh, on his show, uh, invariably he asked the theologian, all, uh, no matter what, what their uh, belief system is, he always asked them about uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the way to get to heaven, is it, is it narrow or are there many ways? Uh, and he'll phrase it like, um, particularly to Christian theologian, right, what about the people, the, 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 the people of other religions that, uh, you know they're they're doing all kinds of charitable good deeds and and they but they just because they didn't believe in Jesus are you saying that they they're going to go to hell just because they didn't ever believe in in, in Jesus and I've seen I, I've watched him ask that question to Billy Graham uh, to Joel Osteen uh, to many others. Uh, the only one that I saw him ask the question where he got the right answer by citing this very verse. Uh, and, and he's, uh, uh, a lot of the people we know on YouTube have really been against this guy too. Uh, he, he got famous uh, by writing the book, The Purpose Driven Life. Uh, his, uh, it's Rick Warren. And he has uh, been working hard for the last 10 or 20 years for ecumenicalism, trying to get the different religions of the world to work together for some kind of common good works. Um, so he's criticized for ecumenicalism. 
But he is the only one that answered the question the way you would answer it, or I would answer it, or that Jesus would answer it, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Jesus. Uh, so um, as much as some people want to criticize Rick, Rick Warren, uh, and he may have some serious errors in his uh, doctrines, I don't know what know that his beliefs that well, but I was happy to see finally, all these years I've watched Larry King pose the question that somebody had the guts to say, Larry, the uh, I believe the Bible. And the Bible says, in fact, in Jesus, his own words, Jesus himself said, there is no other way to get to heaven except through him. And I, you know, he says, I believe Jesus' words. I believe that's true. Uh, whereas you get Billy Graham and Joel Osteen and others, I recall, they didn't answer that correctly. They always hem hawed around. And I don't know. I can't judge other people for their salvation. Um, uh, perhaps there's many ways to get to heaven. And, you know, that kind of uh, answer. Uh, instead of standing up for the, the, the principle that Jesus is the only way, you must put your faith in Jesus to get to heaven. Uh, and, and see, one of the things that I like about this verse is that Jesus not only says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, but he, he doesn't say, I'm a way. I'm one of many different ways from which you can choose. Um, uh, but he says, I'm the way. And then he emphasizes it by, by saying, I'm the, old, I'm the one and only way. In fact, um, no one could come to the Father except through him. Uh, he could not be any more em emphatic, uh, more explicit, with no wiggle room, the way Jesus expressed it in that verse. There's more I want to say. And get Billy Graham to Joel seems to have a huge platform and get on these shows that are seen by millions of people. They're not doing anybody any favors by not speaking the truth and speaking boldly about Jesus Christ. They're not doing anybody any favors. They could have, they could have planted a seed or, or um, you know, somebody that already had a seed planted could have reaped it by just driving that point home. But yet, they want to compromise the gospel and compromise the name of Jesus and confuse millions and millions of people. And I think it comes down to those men that say they are Christians and they're Christian leaders, for whatever reason, they love the praise of men before they love the praise of God. And these Christian leaders who have that platform, they need to speak up in the 21st century, especially in these end times. And they need to speak boldly the gospel, the true gospel, and quit compromising it. Because it makes me sick when I see stuff. I saw the same exact interviews that you saw. And it, it makes my skin crawl when I see these people that will compromise the name of Jesus. And, and they... And here's the thing, if God is not a respecter of person, and Jesus light of every man that cometh into the world, and Jesus and God manifests and shows himself to all, and not only that, but we all will understand his eternal power and Godhead, so that all are without excuse, as it says in Romans 1. And the Godhead is the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost and these three are one. So we need to rest assured that God in his omnipresence, he can handle getting the message to everybody before they die. Because that's what the Bible says. We just have to be part of that. And we have to be the messengers to get his word out and tell others. And when we have a platform, especially on major networks, that are watched by millions, we can't compromise it. We got to tell others. Um, sorry, I just had to rant there. Oh, that really, it really makes me upset when I see that. Oh, uh, that wasn't. I wouldn't consider it a rant. Uh, uh, but you're such a, a gentle and soft-spoken man. 
that uh, even when you get a little bit excited like that, that you 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 can think like, think you're going on a rant. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, I'll tell you, I, I've got a few videos where I've actually really gone on a rant, where I, I've really uh, raised my voice and really felt, you know, righteous indignation and, and stuff. But uh, you don't have to apologize uh, uh, if, if you ever feel like raising your voice and you have, uh, you know, something you need to speak really strongly about. There's no apology uh, required. Uh, but I agree that this is the kind of thing that really makes me upset. And to me, it's like I made the video cursed to be gone. Uh, and I send that to the video, to the video, to the individuals where I finally have given up. I've, I've tried to answer their questions. Uh, their lordship salvationists. And I've tried to uh, patiently deal with them, sending them videos. And I, they, they just refuse. As we talked in the last video, their heart is, they have a bad heart condition. Uh, and that, uh, for that reason, the Bible, they don't understand simple verses that are obvious. And uh, when it reaches the point where I finally give up on them, I, uh, I, I just, it really bothers me because they insist on, on, the way I phrase it is, they're spitting in the face of Jesus on the cross, saying, <laughs> oh, they suffering and dying on the cross and all that shed blood of yours, uh, you know, that really is not enough. It's insufficient. And that uh, if I'm going to go to heaven, Jesus, you just didn't do enough. I'm going to have to follow the commandments and repent and change my life, too, because you didn't do enough. And that is what makes me uh, angry. Um, now, getting back to this, this verse here, uh, there's so much to it. We could, we could probably talk for several hours about this one verse. But when he, Jesus says, I am the way, um, there's another verse here in, in Matthew 7, 13 to 15 is that about the, the narrow gate and the wide gate. And, the, and it says, uh, 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 let me see, uh, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and uh, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life is the way it's expressed. And these are red letters also. This is Jesus' own words. And so he's talking about the way, the narrow way. And then I think this is I uh, connected these two verses here because they both use this word way. But the Lordship Salvationists, they would think that the way is a uh, system of rules and regulations that you've got to follow. That's the way. But in uh, John 14, 6, Jesus lets us know that he is the way, that a, that a person is the way, not a religious uh, system to follow, but a person is the way. And how could a person be the way? Well, it's like the icon that I referenced on my channel where Jesus is reaching his nail-pierced hand out, and you have a lost person reaching out to, to embrace and grab Jesus' hand. And uh, so... That is a picture of Jesus being the way. If you want to be pulled out of condemnation and rescued, then this person, Jesus, the Savior God, he is the way to get rescued. Um, it's, it's not a, the way is not a system of uh, rules and regulations for you to follow. The way is the person of Jesus. Uh, I'm, there's more I want to say about that, but I want to give you a chance to respond. And there's a lot of uh, modern translation that will twist it. The New King James Version, for instance, Matthew 7, 14, will say something along the lines of straight is the gate and difficult is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it, giving you the impression that it's hard and arduous and that it's a journey and that you have to really persevere and be a, a good disciple and follow all the rules in order to receive eternal life and find it because it's difficult and they'll completely twist it. But that's what worship salvation teaching, teaching wants you to believe. They want you to get under the bondage of the law and never put your faith in the true gospel because guess what comes right after those verses? The very next verse, 7, 
15 says, Beware of false prophets. And I've been looking at Matthew 7, as you know, pretty in depth. And it, it's so interesting that these verses uh, come right in between um, the hypocrites and they have the, the hypocrisy of unbelief, the beam in their eyes that they need to get out. But they're telling everybody else to stay under the law and not find the narrow way, which is Jesus. And goes into the false prophets and what fruit they produce. And again, it's not the actions, it's their uh, false converts and false life that, that um, is their fruits from the false gospel that they teach. So, yeah, that's, um, it says narrow is the way. Um, yeah, it's narrow because it's only through Jesus Christ. It's not difficult. Is that it's actually very easy. It's easy as opening a door or eating a piece of bread or drinking a glass of water. Jesus says, I am the door. I'm the bread of life. People living water. So it's as simple as that. Um, so it's not difficult, but it is narrow. Because it's only through him. Yeah, the uh, you're right. The modern translations uh, probably universally uh, do the same thing. Make make the narrow way out to be a difficult way, and it, they, that it's it's narrow because it's so hard if you stray at all. You know, there's a tiny little uh, walk like a, it's a balance beam, and you've got to walk and stay right on that narrow little balance beam because if you stray off at all in sin, then uh, you fail. Uh, that's how they would like to present the narrow way. But as you said, the narrow the narrowness of it is not in uh, in how hard it is. Uh, the narrowness is the fact that uh, it's exclusive. It's this verse where Jesus says, no man cometh to the Father but by me. That's the narrowness. It's saying, look, there's Buddha can't save you. Muhammad can't save you. Uh, the Pope can't save you. The Virgin Mary can't save you. Uh, you cannot save yourself either, no matter how religious you are. Only Jesus can save you. That's the narrowness of it. And so the the way is a person. So I love when Jesus says, "I am the way." Uh, so we got to think of the way as not not a system of rules and regulations, uh, a, a religious um, system, but a a person to rely upon. Uh, now, when we talk about the next part of the verse, says he says, "I am the way." He we can also say. He says, I am the truth. Uh, so if a person wants to know what the truth is, if you're interested in knowing what truth is, Jesus says, the truth is a person. Uh, and how could the truth be a person? What's, uh, what are we supposed to learn from that? that? Jesus says he is the truth. Because I, I think it's the, the only truth that you really need to know. Uh, if you really want to understand uh, theology and study all the theological subject matter and uh, really be a, um, a master of uh, theologian, well, that's fine. But uh, understanding theology doesn't save you uh, because uh, the truth is not a vast, uh, acquiring a vast amount of knowledge. The truth is a person according to Jesus. So the only truth that we need to know is Jesus. Jesus is the truth that we need to believe in. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, he's, you know, there, the word truth is, is mentioned so often in the Bible in the context of uh, the Word of God and, and Jesus Christ and, you know, sanctified and through Thy truth, thy word is truth in John 17, 17. Um, one of the things that is kind of humorous, I guess, is in John 18, 38, when Pilate is looking directly in Jesus' eyes and asks him what is truth. And he's staring absolute truth, the way, the truth, the lie, directly in the eyes and asking. Um, and so, you know, obviously Pilate was blinded by unbelief uh, at that point in time. 
Uh, even though um, he said that he found no fault in him, um, who knows if he ultimately put his trust in Jesus Christ as his Savior, speaking about Pilate. But um, I'd be interested to, to see going back to um, Matthew 7, 13 and 14, where it talks about straight is the gate, there is the way which leadeth unto life. What the Amplified Version says there. Uh, it's not good. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad and easy to travel is the path that leads the way to destruction and eternal loss, and there are many who enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow and difficult to travel is the path that leads <laughs> the leads the way to everlasting life. And yeah, so they yeah. added, um, you know, instead of changing the word narrow to difficult, they just added to it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so here, you know, we've, uh, uh, we, you, you're, uh, you still hold that uh, uh, title, uh, KJV onlyest. And, uh, uh, I'm a KJV firstist, and the, the really the only distinction is that we, I, I think we're in agreement that that we consider that to be the scriptures. But to me, I want to look at the others and compare. Sometimes they're helpful, but sometimes if we compare it to the KJV, we can see there there's a serious problem. Uh, we see from the KJV that uh, uh, this uh, this narrowness is 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 really we should understand it as that it's there's no other person there's no other religious system there's just simply jesus is the only way so it's it's representing the exclusivity as as the the, the difficult thing about it is that uh you've got to come to the conclusion that jesus is the only way uh, uh, whereas all these modern translations as we see here and the others that you've cited sure enough they all want to make uh the narrowness were uh, they interpret that as being difficult. Uh, so it's, it's really hard. You've got to really make sure you're really religious and, and get that sin out of your life. Uh, so uh, the, Jesus is the way. So the way is a person. The truth is a person. And what about the life? Jesus said he's the life. Uh, he, he he is the source of life because we know that Jesus is the creator. Uh, all things were made by him. Um, all matter and energy and life itself were um, generated by Jesus himself. So he is the source of life. Then not only did he bring us to life, but he's the only source to life everlasting, to the, the new birth, uh, to be born again as a... As, child of God and, and have eternal life, he's the sole source of eternal life. So uh, it certainly is appropriate for Jesus to claim that he is uh, the life. And uh, now, uh, interesting thing about uh, in uh, More Than a Carpenter, Josh McDowell's book, he makes a real big deal about this. And I think this is a very valid point in that imagine uh, uh, someone claiming that they are the way, the only way to get to heaven, uh, that they, they're the truth, the only truth that you need to understand, you must get this one thing right. You could be wrong about everything in the world, but you better get this one truth right, and it's to trust Jesus. And the life, if you want life everlasting, if you want to go to heaven and have everlasting life, Jesus is the sole source of it. So, if Jesus made that claim, I mean, no one's ever made a greater, more boastful claim. So is he is he a, a false prophet claiming something that's not true? Uh, is he uh, so that would make him a deceiver and a liar? Or is he, let's say, an insane person, like a person that's uh, uh, on the street that's talking to himself and yelling that he's Napoleon, you know, uh, like a. The thing, or maybe someone that thinks he's a, you know, a mashed potatoes, you know. Uh, so is, is he a deceiver or is he an insane person or is he who he claimed to be? Uh, the way, the truth, and the life. So um, 
It's, it's the boldest, most outlandish claim ever made in history. And that's what we need to do. We need to wrestle with that and say, do I believe him or think he's an insane or a person or a liar? And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So there you see the way, the truth, and the life through Jesus Christ, um, also in First John 5, 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and He, uh, uh, you know, you this kind of a statement in John 14, 6, and uh, other places uh, where Jesus said that uh, 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 he's the God is his own father, and that uh, and that he uh, he is uh, um, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. When when he made those statements, the Jews condemned him and said, when you say things like that. You're you're making yourself equal with God, and and uh, so they're going, we're going to stone you. And, and uh, so they wanted to stone him. And Jesus said, "Well, well what do I do wrong? You want to stone me?" He's, they said, "Because you're making yourself equal with God." And it was very clear. He it was uh, he was very clearly claiming that he is equal with God. He is God. And in fact, the Son of God, just like my Son, is equal to me in humanity. Jesus is equal to the Father in God, God, Godness. Um, so they wanted to stone him for that. That was blasphemy in their eyes. Uh, and the, Jesus' reply is, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So it's so important that we, you, a person comes to the conclusion that Jesus' claims are true, that he is who he claimed to be. Uh, the, the sole source of life everlasting, uh, God himself manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. So if you do not believe that he is who we claim to be, you will die in your sins, according to Jesus. Anything else to say about John 14, 6? I think we've covered it pretty well. Okay, we'll move on to then to... Uh, the next one is uh, 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6. Uh, you're a very humble man, saying that we covered it uh, very well, pretty well, pretty well. I, I think we, I, 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 no, no, I think we covered it great. It was a very good job, and I think everybody will, uh, there's no, there should be no confusion uh, as to what that verse means and the importance of, of the, the verses. Uh, so we'll go on now to, uh, uh, let me see, let me paste it in here. First, First Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6. Uh, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Okay, brother, teach us. Well, this goes hand in hand with the last verse being that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that no man cometh unto the Father but by Jesus. And so this I'm sure when uh, whoever made this list was making it, that was the next thing they thought of was, no man coming to the Father but by Jesus, and there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So, um, I'm not surprised that this verse pops up next. But this is uh, a great verse to uh, testify that Jesus Christ um, is the Son of God, and that his sacrifice on the cross was a ransom for all. Um, you know, he he is our redeemer. He's our mediator, um, arbitrator.
trader. You know, he, he's an intercess, intercessor. Uh, these are all synonymous. Uh, and we see these different um, words spoken um, about Jesus. Um, you know, being the intercessor for our sins and the Redeemer. Um, and this just goes hand in hand um, with that. Yeah, there are some. Uh, I guess uh, there's two verses, uh, and each each part each verse makes a very important um, uh, statement. Uh, verse five: There is one God and one mediator between God and men, uh, the man Christ Jesus. So, uh, Jesus is the one we need to go to, uh, rather than his mother, uh, Mary. In Roman Catholicism, they're taught to pray to Mary and use her as the mediator or intercessor. So you ask Mary to, hey, talk to talk to Jesus for us, Mary. You know? <laughs> uh, but this verse clearly says that the only mediator between God and us is, is Jesus. Uh, and then the, the second, in verse 6, it says, who gave himself a ransom for all. A, a ransom is a payment made to set someone else free. If, uh, brother, if I know that you're a, you know, a, not a criminal, but if, if you were a, a, a bad person and you decided to kidnap someone and, and tell their family that, they're not going to get their loved one back unless they pay you a sum of money. And then they agree to give you that money uh, so that they could be set free. Uh, that's how we understand what a ransom is. So when we apply that to, to Jesus, how does that um, work? So that, you know, he gave himself a ransom for all. What does that mean? He paid our penalty um, to allow us to be free because our debt has been paid. Uh, and we trust in that, that he did that for us and overcame death because of the penalty um, that he paid for us. He reconciled us to himself, God did, through his son, Jesus Christ. And, you know, you can look at it like an earthly judge, you know, an, an earthly judge, if we have committed a sin of death on this earth and we are convicted and go through trial and the jury has their verdict and you're guilty and everybody knows you're guilty, you're caught red-handed and you're thrown into prison with a death sentence, then that judge, he would be just in giving you that death sentence, um, you know, upholding the law of the land. In the same sense, when we, when we transgress spiritual law in the spiritual world, that also leads to death, and that we're condemned in those transgressions, that will lead to a death penalty, the second death, the spiritual death. But what God does for us, because he loves us so much that no earthly judge would ever do, is to get his son in the place of your penalty and pardon you and release you and ransom you so that you can be at liberty and free if you simply will trust in him that he did it for you. And when you look at it in that context, you see how much love, how much mercy, how much grace God truly has. Um, you know, I've, I've been looking at the word love in the Bible and unstained love, um, you know, perfect love. And no matter how much we try to love one another on this earth, I don't think we will ever reach that perfection of love in this 
mortal flesh that God shows us on a day-to-day basis. And, um, you know, this, this verse you, you mentioned, uh, the Catholic Church prays for Mary as a mediator, um, and that they believe Mary will talk to her son, who then will go to the Father. Um, but, you know, this clears it up to me uh, in First Timothy 2 5 that there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Um, so, that one verb is believed and trusted um, to uh, cause somebody in Roman Catholicism who has been taught this uh, to question it and and look into it more to see if truly what they're being told by their church is accurate and true, or is this or if this is man's tradition and man's doctrine and not of God, out of God's word. And hopefully um, there will be people that are in the Catholic Church that will um, come to this realization and um, pray in the name of Jesus and and not um, do the Hail Marys and, and those type of things because those prayers aren't being heard. Um, you know, because it's going through the mediator who doesn't have that intimacy that Jesus does to the Heavenly Father. Um, you know, only we can only come to um, God, the Heavenly Father, through Jesus. Um, and, and that is with a lot of things that we do, you know, obviously salvation, I'll put in the faith and trust of Jesus Christ, but that's also in our day-to-day intercession and prayer, uh, our supplication to God, that also um, we should pray in the name of Jesus so that he will uh, be our mediator and inter- intercessor um, so that he can help in our lives and in, in our prayer lives and in what we need and and he knows what we need as, as believers, and we'll take care of his children. Um, but it's good to develop that prayer relationship. We just need to be praying to uh, the one true God through Jesus Christ when we do it. And just one other thing with developing a prayer life, um, as we mature, we should really understand that we shouldn't be asking for God to do our will and ask for these earthly things, the material things and things of that nature, but rather ask God in prayer that we can do his will. And so whatever he has for us in this world, whatever his plan and purpose is for our lives, that through prayer and helping that relationship, whatever it may be, that he gives us the strength, the courage, the direction to do his will and not the other way around. Hmm. Well, um, I want to talk a little more about that word ransom. Uh, Jesus uses it another time. Uh, this is our, First Timothy is a letter Paul wrote to Timothy, his uh, like spiritual son. And he, and I think that Paul led Timothy or, and maybe his mother uh, to, to salvation, and he's Timothy is uh, uh, one of the uh, pastoral epistles, and he's teaching Timothy how to be a pastor uh, in this book. But he uh, so here Jesus when he uses the word ransom, he says, um, "Do not think I came to be served, but rather to serve." Uh, and to give my life as a ransom for many. So he served uh, mankind by, by all the miraculous, wonderful things he did, by uh, teaching us the truth. Uh, and, and then uh, the greatest service, of course, was when he says, 
to give my life as a ransom for many. Now he says a ransom for many, and Paul here in First Timothy says a ransom for all. Um, and there's no contradiction because uh, if, uh, let's say there's a million people that exist, and uh, if, you, if, you, if you're a ransom for all of the million, uh, okay, you can say, yeah, you're a ransom for all. But uh, you could also just say, I'm a ransom for many because a million is, is, is a quite a large number, it's many. So, um, but the, the Calvinists would like to say, see, Jesus is only a ransom for many, but not, not all people. He's not uh, in the uh, uh, tulip, the limited atonement doctrine they have. That's how they would interpret that verse. Uh, but what I think is important about the word ransom is that, uh, as I said, a ransom is a payment made to set someone else free. So Jesus is, is the payment. He gave himself a ransom. So if you paid a million dollars to set someone free that you loved, uh, that would be the ransom paid. Jesus paid the ransom of his suffering and shed blood and death. That was the ransom payment uh, for all. And now what we... Uh, what was this ransom paid to set, to set us free from what? Well, uh, Jesus said that uh, uh, whoever believes in the Son is not condemned, but whosoever, whosoever believeth not the Son is condemned already because he had not believed in the uh I guess, only begotten son or the name of the son. I, I, I'm not quoting exactly right, but the point, the point is that Jesus says the, the default natural state of man is condemnation. So he, he gave himself as a ransom to set us free from that condemnation. That's, and and uh, so we're free from condemnation and judgment. Brother, you're not going to get judged. Right? When you die... And then at some point in time, Jesus will raise us all from the dead. And, and, then, and then we go to the judgment seat of Christ. But it's not to be judged for our uh, sins, since Jesus already gave his life as a ransom. So we're not condemned for our sin. But you're going to only be judged to see how many rewards you've earned through your ministerial uh, works. Uh, but the people who never put their faith in Jesus... Uh, then they're still in condemnation. So uh, they, they need to be rescued from condemnation and the judgment. You're rescued from the judgment. You don't have to worry about that. You're already declared righteous. Um, let me see, how much time do we have left here? Uh, yeah, we have two minutes left here. Uh, anything else on that verse uh, before we ask you to kind of sum it up? Uh, you're uh, muffled a little bit. Your sound is a little bit muffled now. Did you change your position of the phone or something? Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. I don't know what okay. you did, but it doesn't fit. In the, in the Catholic Church, they also have um, a tenet of indulgences where family members pay the Catholic Church um, for that person in the family who's died and it, it almost is like an earthly ransom that they're trying to um, go through the church for that soul who's died so that they will um, have a better outcome in eternity uh, if you look at Psalm 49.7 it says none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. And so just like we were looking at 1 Timothy 2.5 um, about praying to Mary as a mediatrix and how that verse blows that out of the water, I think, you know, there's many verses that we can go to to teach against the false doctrine of indulgences. Mm -hmm. And getting back to 
Yeah, when you were, before you mentioned Job, my mind was on Job and that, that verse, Ransom, and uh, then, you, then you went right to it. Uh, uh, but uh, when we talked in our last uh, video about Job, uh, again, again it's, I was blown away when I really decided I'm going to study this verse by verse. I was just blown away by all of these verses like that, with the references to a uh, a ransom, the reference to him having a bodily resurrection and seeing meeting God face to face, and all those things in Job. It, it was just, I was just so happy reading Job and seeing that uh, it's he's so right about salvation, even though his so called friends, uh, they were just antagonizing, they were so wrong. They didn't, they didn't get it at all. But, uh, all right, we can. Uh, yeah, and if, 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 if any person has not seen the, the series I did on Job, I hope you people have watched that. Um, all right, brother, uh, I don't think we have time to do another verse, so let me ask you to kind of sum, summarize the study for today again. I think today was, we spent a lot of time on John 14, 6, and in the last uh, passage of 1 Timothy 2, 5, 6, showing the sufficiency of Christ, the um, narrow way that is Jesus Christ, and, and that there's no other way. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and I think it was time well spent to really delve into those two verses, specifically John 14, 6, which we probably spent maybe uh, close to half of the half of this video on, um, and we could have spent a lot more time on it, but um, this was an excellent study, uh, Ezekiel 33, 13. Uh, again, yesterday we spent, um, I think, most of the time looking at Old Testament passages out of Jeremiah and Job. And we started today with Ezekiel 33 and ended up, actually, that wasn't on the list, but ended up speaking about uh, Jesus being a ransom. Um, and... Uh, finishing today's discussion in the book of Job. So, uh, Jesus is pointed to throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins and overcame death for you, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, you are a child of God, and then the next step as a baby in Christ, the mature and the scriptures develop a prayer life and begin to circle yourself with other like-minded believers. I think doing this with you has really edified me, um, and I thank you so much for reaching out to me. Uh, this is a blessing to do this with you, um, but we need to understand that it's not anything that we do once we have received eternal life, that free gift, it's all what he did, what we do from that point on, after our spiritual rebirth, our spiritual birthday, is about being a follower of Jesus Christ, being a disciple of Him. And we're going to have ups and downs along the way, but we should always be looking forward to the cross, living in the Spirit, living in 
his righteousness and his right standing that the Holy Spirit gives us, not looking back at the law, which is the knowledge of sin. You don't grow looking back, you grow looking forward. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well said. Um, and nothing else needs to be said. And so I, I hope the viewers uh, uh, pay close attention and understand the truth. Uh, and you just summed up the truth. Just put your faith in Jesus and, and believe in him for your salvation. Um, he, he said that if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So you better believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He is God and Savior, and he's the sole source of life. So if you want to have life everlasting, and if you want to get, and live forever in the new heavens and the new earth, then uh, there's only one way to achieve that, and to receive it, I should say. And you receive it as a gift from Jesus. So put your faith in Jesus, and you get it, and there's no strings attached. There's nothing due or debt on your part. Uh, but once you've received it, uh, and you're, you're assured you're going to go to heaven. Now, uh, uh, I think Paul says it is, uh, what, uh, maybe you can tell me how he phrases it, but it, it, it's only right that uh, we should do our part and now want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, focus on him, serve him, follow, follow his uh, commands as, as far as loving each other and and, this, and, and follow the example that he set when he washed the apostles' feet. He taught us how he wants us to be after we become a child of God. So and that's, and, But that's something that uh, begins, once you put your faith in Jesus, now the, the, the work begins. Not to get saved or stay saved or prove you're saved, but in order to uh, do what is right. Uh, what is that verse, brother? Uh, you know the one I'm thinking of? Uh, about that, reasonable yeah, our reasonable, or what's our reasonable service? You know where that is. You're much better at knowing where the verses are. <laughs> uh, I am trying to think where that is. Uh, it's in Romans chapter eight, verse one. Yeah. All right. Well, the point is, is, is you know, pretty simple anyway. But hey, it's it's only reasonable. It's like uh, once I understood how much Jesus loved me and what He did for me. Uh, it was only natural for me to, to love him in return. Uh, the scripture says we love him because he first loved us. So understand. In Romans 12, Romans 12, 1. Yeah. Um, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself, that, for, that you present your, your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's not too much to ask that after everything Jesus has done for you, and you're going to go to heaven now, it's not too much to ask, hey, now why don't you study your Bible and, and, and hang out with other believers and worship him together and pray. And, and as you do that, uh, you will grow and mature uh, into a, a, a mature Christian instead of remaining a baby. <laughs> okay. All right, brother. Um, uh, thanks again for joining me today. And I guess you're going to be on and taking a little vacation, so uh, uh, in, a, in a week or so, I guess we'll, we'll pick this up again, huh? Sounds good. We'll do it again in a week, I will. All right. And to the viewers, uh, bless you. In the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.